Accountant at the Department of Gastro and also Hepato Hepatology in Tan Tock Seng Hospital. So um, I have been working there for quite a number of years actually, um, has really received a long, long service award already. So it's been more than 10 years. So uh, without further ado, maybe I will just start to share my slides. So um, if you have any questions later, feel free to type into the Q&A function later. Uh, we will try to uh, answer all your questions. All right. Um, can everybody see the slides? I hope you can. Okay, can. All right, so without further ado, um, I'll just start. Okay, speak a bit louder. Okay, I hold the mic nearer to me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, feel free to interrupt uh, if there's any question or any queries. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm a consultant at the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. So what that means is the Department of the Intestine, Stomach, Colon, and also the Liver. So I work in Tan Tock Seng Hospital for more than 10 years. Um, other than my clinical work, I'm also um, deeply involved in medical education as well. Uh, I'm the program director for the National Healthcare Group Internal Medicine Residency Program, where we have about 100 plus young doctors training with us. So the goals of my sharing this afternoon will be to let um, all of you know um, how to tell your doctors about your abdominal pain if you need to seek a consultation in the future, and also to recognize what are the worrisome symptoms and when you need to seek help early. And lastly, I will just share a few more common uh, intestinal ailments that can cause abdominal pain. But what I cannot achieve in this one hour is to cover all possible causes of abdominal pain. And also, um, this talk itself will not actually replace a proper consultation by a doctor. Then, um, well, I hope uh, this talk doesn't give you a good nap uh, over the next one hour. <laughs> All right, so um, information that the doctors would wish that you can tell us during the consultation. So essentially, I'd just like to use um, a couple of slides to just um, share with you what doctors would like to hear from you when you present to them with um, symptoms of abdominal pain. Because preparing for your consultation really maximizes the yield. Um, you get all your questions answered and you have a better understanding of your illness as well. So um, I think one important thing is uh, you need to be familiar with your symptoms. Uh, what are the medical conditions that you have, for example, like high blood pressure, diabetes, or any other conditions that you may have. And it will be also very useful if you could share with us a list of the medications uh, that you are taking, because um, some of the medications that you take may be responsible for the symptoms that you may be um, experiencing. If you have had any um, investigation done in the private sector, um, maybe a scopes or a scans or even any blood tests uh, that may be related to your abdominal pain, um, do also bring along because um, if things are already done, then really when you see a doctor, um, he or she may not need to repeat the investigations again. So it'd be very useful if you could bring them along. So bring either the physical copy if you can, uh, but some of them may be very thick. Alternative to that is you may also want to consider taking photos of the reports or even the medication that you are taking so that it is very portable, it's easy to carry around and there's no need to carry so many heavy things around. So knowing your symptoms will be important. Um, it would be useful to perhaps in this very short uh, one hour session to just share with you a little bit um, how to actually um, describe your symptoms. So you can see the image on the right side. Usually we like to divide the abdomen into nine portions. So um, in general, the doctors would like to ask you which area is the painful part of your tummy. So it'd be useful if you could um, help us um, tell us where exactly the pain is. And also for the onset, um, when did it start? If the pain is something that start, that is new in onset, meaning um, over the past few weeks or one or two months, it is likely to be more um, of something more of concern compared to something that has been there for the past 20 or 30 years. Because the longer the illness, uh, the symptoms are, the less likely it's going to be anything sinister. 
in addition, um, you will also hope that you could tell us the character of your pain. Um, so whether it's more like a crampy discomfort or a burning sensation, or is it a very sharp, like a needle poking inside, that kind of feeling. And lastly, whether it, and next is whether it runs anywhere else to um, the back of your, uh, to, to your back, or whether it runs up your shoulder blades, and whether it's associated with any other symptoms like weight loss, poor appetite, and um, and also if you 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 will be also useful if you could um, tell us whether the pain whether it's constant in nature, and uh, whether it's up and down up and down, and if there's anything that can make the pain better or worse that will also be useful, and lastly the severity of the pain will be something that will be important for you to share with us, meaning whether it's severe enough to actually wake you up from your sleep whether it's severe enough to actually cause you to um, uh, not be able to work. So to summarize, um, this whole sequence is what we call Socrates, which is an easy way to uh, remember um, how you describe your pain. But if you couldn't remember everything, it's fine, because the doctors will generally guide you when we ask you questions. But do be mindful that these are the things that they will generally ask, so um, if you have prepared for the uh, questions already, um, you will make the consultation a lot easier as well. So this is possibly the most important slide that I have for this entire uh, session, which are the symptoms that possibly need you to pay a bit more attention. And perhaps um, you may want to seek a, a doctor's uh, consultation to just double check to make sure everything is okay. So of course, as I mentioned just now, if a pain has been there for the past 30 years, 40 years, in general, it shouldn't be a worrisome problem. Uh, but of course, if it's a new onset pain that is past two weeks, but getting worse and worse, affecting your ability to sleep at night, or if it affects you and you're causing you, uh, it's causing you to lose weight or make you unable to eat well, or even perhaps when you pass motion, you have been passing out more, uh, watery stools than usual or suddenly you've been very constipated or if there's even blood when you pass out your motion associated with vomiting or if you look very pale, yellow or jaundice or having, having low grade fever. These are all not normal symptoms. So if you have any of this type of symptoms, it will be good if you could actually seek a doctor's opinion or consultation to see um, whether this pain is something of, uh, that needs more attention or more investigation. Okay, so I will just quickly just cover the more uh, common uh, causes of abdominal pain, and I'll limit it to the intestinal tract. That means um, things like the gynae or perhaps kidney problems, all this I will not cover. So if you, if you follow the, 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 uh, my earlier slides about the location of the pain, uh, you, um, it's useful for doctors because the location of the pain helps us decide what could be the causes of the pain in the area that you're suffering from. So this is a very busy slide that just possibly tell you every single thing in your body can be causing uh, pain in your tummy, even your heart. Um, attack can cause abdominal pain, lung infection can cause pain, blood vessel problem, gynae problem, kidney problem can also cause pain. So it's really quite complex. Um, so it's really up to the doctors to help to um, dissect your symptoms and find out what is the most likely cause of the, uh, of the pain that you're suffering from. Yeah, it's really too many things to remember. So um, don't worry about this slide. So Three most common um, abdominal symptoms, uh, we, uh, upper abdominal symptoms are what we call dyspepsia, which is what we, uh, commonly we call as gastric pain or gastritis, reflux or heartburn, and also bloating symptoms. So we just cover these three um, briefly. So for dyspepsia, um, it is what we commonly know as uh, gastric pain or gastritis. And the pain is usually in the middle and top part of the abdomen. Um, commonly, patients may describe the pain as a burning or uh, there's fire in my tummy or there's this spicy kind of feeling inside. So common triggers will be things like sour food and drinks. So when the food is sour, in general, it is acidic in nature. So acidic food like oranges 
or even black coffee, black tea, uh, may actually worsen gastric discomfort. Um, I know many people like to eat spicy food, especially Singaporeans. Um, we, the thing about spicy food is the spice itself tends to also exacerbate the gastric discomfort. Then for those who likes, um, who enjoys alcohol, do note that alcohol itself can also um, cause gastric discomfort. And of course, the higher the alcohol content, uh, the more likely it's going to cause the discomfort. For example, if you're drinking whiskey uh, or even other hard liquors, they are more common than, say, beer. Smoking itself can actually um, tend to cause gastric discomfort and also sometimes um, gastric ulcers as well. Having irregular meals tend to exacerbate the discomfort. And for some of the patients, they may also be taking medications that actually can cause gastric pain. So um, it's important for you to know um, what are the medication that you are taking and bring along the list so that the doctors can help you go through to see any of this medication, whether it could be a cause of the pain. Then lastly, um, an infection of the stomach itself um, can also cause pain. Things that tend to make this pain better um, will be after consumption of meal. And some people do find drinking milk helps with the pain because it's generally a bit more alkaline in nature. Um, then, of course, the over-the-counter drugs like antacids or common medicine like omeprazole tend to also improve symptoms for that. So um, these are the common list of medication that tend to cause uh, gastric discomfort. So the most common thing is, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you might have heard like gast um, painkillers are not good for your stomach. So in general, these are what we call the non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Commonly known uh, medicine are like ibuprofen, diclofenac, fastum, all these are the more common, stronger painkillers, and they tend to cause gastric discomfort. However, not all painkillers cause that. Um, things like Panadol or paracetamol, which is the active drugs, they actually don't tend to cause um, uh, gastric discomfort. Other common medication would include aspirin, um, especially for patients with history of heart disorders or stroke before, they may be taking aspirin. So those with symptoms of gastric pain, sometimes um, they may actually take uh, gastric medication together with the aspirin, or they may even need to change to alternative medication. So um, patients who need to take high dose steroids also tend to get a lot of gastric symptoms. For antibiotics, it's actually very common uh, a cause of gastric discomfort. Some people after taking antibiotics may feel that they get very bad burning sensation over the upper abdomen. They may even get nausea and vomiting sometimes. And for IA supplement, it's also quite common. Uh, because it, not only does it cause constipation, sometimes it causes um, gastric discomfort, a burning sensation as well. Then um, patients with diabetes, some medication can cause, and some of the osteoporosis medicine also tend to worsen the symptoms. So we talked about um, infection of the stomach earlier. So the specific bacteria that we are talking about here is helicobacter. So helicobacter is actually a very common uh, infection in the world. Um, this is more common in the developing country, which we used to be uh, in Singapore. So um, the published, there's a study um, published in 2016 that suggests that Singaporeans, um, the about 31% of the population has been infected with helicobacter pylori. So commonly for this infection, it is through um, eat, in eating of, uh, dirty food. Uh, because the food, I mean, usually it's through this contaminated food, after we eat it, then we can get the infection. So um, if the food in, in general is well prepared, is cooked, and the chef who prepares it is uh, clean, um, the chances of you acquiring helicobacter infection will be less common. So now that Singapore in general, the food preparation standards um, has actually improved significantly compared to 50 years ago. The incidence of helicobacter in Singapore, especially the younger um, population, is actually dropping significantly. So how do you then tell whether you have this infection? Um, sometimes symptoms that patient may have uh, will be just gastric discomfort. There may also be sim uh, patients without any symptoms at all. And when they go for health uh, checkup, where they do a blood test, that's where they were noted to have this infection. So common ways to diagnose this infection would be through a blood test, a breath test where you just blow into this machine, 
or a scope uh, will be necessary to confirm this diagnosis. There, of course, in the event that somebody has been diagnosed with this infection, uh, you may need to take uh, at least a uh, 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 cocktail of antibiotics. So there's a question about eating raw fish like sushi, sashimi, whether they can get helicobacter infection. So um, it's not the uh, raw fish per se that is causing the infection, but rather perhaps if the sushi chef is um, just went to the toilet and he has this helicobacter infection, and when he prepares the food, um, he's not the cleanest, and he just touches the raw fish. And then when you eat that sushi, you can get it. So it's not just sushi because if he's preparing fried chicken and the chicken has already been fried and left there, it's no longer so hot and he just uses his hand to touch the chicken and put it on your plate, uh, you can potentially still get it as well. It's more of the preparation uh, process and also the, the water source, whether it's clean. Because in Singapore, the water source is very, very clean. Unlike some countries where the, they may just drink off the river or even the drain and it may not necessarily be the cleanest as well. Okay. So when you see a doctor for this gastric discomfort, usually what we will do is we try to look, um, help you look for any reversible causes like medical conditions or any medication that you are taking. That of course help you accordingly. And other things we have to exclude will be this infection because if you think about it, 31% is about one in three Singaporeans has it. Um, then if the symptoms are more severe, more constant, uh, we also have to exclude things like ulcer, uh, peptic ulcer. Then lastly, depending on how uh, the symptoms are, meaning if there's any associated weight loss or poor appetite, or there's a, history, fam a strong family history of cancer, then the doctors may also be obliged to help you exclude um, stomach cancer uh, for the patient. And other than that, um, because it's upper tummy, liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, and pancreas cancer also can cause pain around the same area. So next, we will go and talk about reflux. So for reflux itself, it's a description of fire burning in the chest. And sometimes patients may even feel a sensation of um, food coming up the chest into the mouth. Um, it's also otherwise commonly known as heartburn. So um, in terms of the triggers, it's quite similar to dyspepsia. But of course, additional triggers will be overeating, which is quite common because uh, Singapore has a lot of good food um, and we love buffet, so we tend to overeat um, very frequently. Then of course, eating very oily food tend to worsen the symptom as well because oily food is harder to digest and the food stays longer in the stomach. So the longer it stays in the stomach, the more likely it is to reflux up into your chest. Then as we put on weight, um, as we gain BMI, get heavier and heavier, patients may also be more prone to reflux. Then of course, if you wear tight trousers or skirt, then if you sit down, then there's this um, band, tight band around your tummy. Uh, it's also more prone um, for you to get reflux symptoms, especially if you've just finished your meal. Then of course, after a heavy meal and then you decide to lie down uh, on your bed and ready to sleep soon after your buffet, um, you may tend to feel that, that this sour sensation of fire feeling coming up your chest. And those are usually reflux. So to put it in a more pictorial way of um, uh, uh, explaining it, uh, let me see uh, whether I can get my annotation tool up. Okay, let me see, draw. Okay, so over here, you can see is what we call the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, or maybe an easier way we just call it like a door uh, uh, that is um, closing the, the upper part of the stomach. So for this door itself, um, usually there is a muscle that actually closes it tight um, to minimize the chance of food actually coming up into the food pipe, which is esophagus here. So what happens is um, sometimes this muscle uh, may be a bit loose and um, it may be due to multiple reasons like medication, medical conditions. So um, when it's a bit loose, the door doesn't close properly, the food tends to go up and reflux up. And of course, as you know, stomach um, juice is acidic in nature. So it may actually cause burning sensation in the chest, which is what, uh, how we describe as heartburn. Okay. 
Okay. So just now we mentioned about positional changes. So you can imagine if the stomach is full of fluid or food, when we lie down, um, essentially it's like a, you are tilting a, a vase full of water uh, horizontally and the water inside will tend to flow out of the vase, which is into your mouth. Lah. But however, um, if a person is very prone to reflux, putting a wedge or something to prop the person up um, will minimize um, the, the chances of food actually regurgitating up and also reduce the symptoms of reflux without the need to take medication. So when a patient with reflux symptoms come and see a doctor, usually as um, similar to the dyspepsia, we would like to rule out any reversible causes from medication or medical condition. Uh, we may also want to rule out whether there could be any anatomical uh, problems. That means a patient may be born with this condition called hiatal hernia, which is on the picture on the right, uh, where you see a portion of the stomach actually coming up uh, to, to above the diaphragm, which is over here, I try to draw for you. You can see a portion of the stomach above the diaphragm here. So um, the diaphragm can no longer close this uh, opening of the stomach very well. So when patients have hiatal hernia, they may be more prone to get gastric juice flowing upwards uh, into the chest. Okay. Okay, then um, for patients with very long-term uh, reflux symptoms, uh, we will then have to actually rule out um, cancer of the esophagus, which is the food pipe, because long-term acid burning of the food pipe can predispose a person to develop cancer of the food pipe. The next symptoms will be bloating. So for bloating, uh, one tend to describe it like a balloon sensation, commonly in the upper or uh, middle tummy. And it feels like the balloon is getting bigger and bigger. So triggers wise is very similar as dyspepsia and bloating, um, but other contributory uh, uh, causes will be things like constipation. Because if you can imagine what goes in but doesn't come out, um, you get bigger and bigger. So um, if a, a patient have a previous history of abdominal operation, uh, they may be also more prone to develop uh, gastric uh, intestinal bloating symptoms. Then um, patients with medical conditions like Parkinson's disease, the intestinal movement becomes slower. So they also become uh, more likely to develop bloating symptoms. Then for some medication that patients may be taking, uh, they may also re uh, result in uh, more uh, bloating symptoms. There is a question about um, what are the causes of hiatal hernia. So for hiatal hernia, it is a, 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 a problem that we are born with. That means um, it's not a acquired illness, but rather uh, something that you are born with, a part of the stomach above the diaphragm. So most of the time, if it's mild, there's really nothing very much uh, we need to do about it other than lifestyle measures, meaning don't overeat, don't eat already, immediately lie down. But there are some patients where this hiatal hernia is huge. Um, usually for those patients, we would usually recommend surgery. But most of that will be diagnosed early on in their life. Lah. My grandmother had a very large hiatal hernia, but uh, she's 90 years old and um, she, she's still very well lah, without much symptoms, without the need to do anything. So there's a question about whether reflux can be diagnosed through endoscopy and the answer is yes. There are also other um, uh, uh, medical methods that we can confirm whether the patient's symptoms are truly reflux related. Um, for those, uh, it will be best if you see the uh, gastric specialist for that. Um, they will be able to advise you uh, what are the investigation that's most suited for you. But most of the time, the first investigation we would offer is to consider doing a stomach scope first, just to check um, the severity of the reflux, whether it has caused ulceration of the food pipe. And of course, if the reflux symptoms is very long-term, uh, whether there could be any condition that predisposes a patient to a slightly higher risk of developing um, cancer of the food pipe in the future. Uh, sleeping sideways may potentially help with the reflux symptoms. <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll, I'll move on with the bloating uh, first, then I will maybe address any other similar reflux uh, questions later. So um, as mentioned for bloating itself, um, uh, medication itself can be a cause. 
Yeah, uh, the balloon must expand. <laughs> okay, so um, other things when um, when a patient come and see a doctor that the doctors need to exclude will be to look at your medication list to see which are the medication that can potentially cause a patient to be more bloated, and whether he he or she has any medical conditions like Parkinson's disease or any other rare conditions that may actually reduce the intestine movement, the speed of the intestine movement. Um, important thing that we also need to examine the patient because we also have to exclude bloating due to non-gas distension because um, patients may complain that oh, my tummy is so big, so bloated. Um, what the doctors are obliged to do is whether this um, bloating is truly due to gas um, and, or is it because there is a growth uh, that's making the tummy bigger than usual, or there's a lot of abnormal water accumulating within the abdomen that could be causing the bloating symptoms. So which is why um, it, 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 the, the proper consultation cannot be replaced by just a Zoom session where we can only speak to you, uh, but we are not able to do a proper physical examination to exclude all this. Lah. So that's why um, um, when we do a video consultation, uh, this is a, a major limitation that our patients will need to understand. Okay, so I just share common food triggers. So um, for all the three symptoms, bloating, um, uh, reflux, and also dyspepsia. So um, alcohol is one of the very important cause of it because alcohol, not only does it, um, the, al the alcohol itself, not only does it cause direct irritant, irritation to the stomach, some of the alcohol that you drink um, have a lot of gas as well, especially the champagne or beer. So this actually tend to worsen the bloating. And alcohol itself actually um, loosen the, the door so that the sphincter, which is the muscle, the diaphragm, doesn't close as tight. So alcohol essentially makes you get gastric pain, makes you more prone to reflux and make you have bloating symptoms. So other food itself that can cause, uh, as I mentioned, the sour, which uh, tends to be acidic. So common things are coffee, tea, or the juices, the fruit juices. Um, however, I have to say that not these are just common food uh, triggers, but it may not be the same for everybody because everyone is slightly different. Some people cannot drink coffee because after drinking coffee, you tend to get gastric pain. Um, but then other people drink coffee, no problem, can, no problem. So it's really up to individual, but these are the more common triggers that I wanted to share with you. Um, other than that, carbonated drinks are also acidic in nature and also they form a lot of gas. So they tend to um, cause uh, worsened uh, bloating symptoms. And of course, um, fatty or fried food and spicy food um, are also very common triggers that can worsen all these uh, upper abdominal pain symptoms. So if you look at the list, uh, essentially it's something that you will eat or drink during a party. Lah. Okay. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Next page first. Okay. So um, specific food triggers for reflux uh, will be caffeinated products. So um, the caffeine itself actually tend to uh, make the lower esophageal sphincter, which is the door that I was talking about just now, a bit more lax and it doesn't close very tight. So when that happens, um, a person tend to get reflux more often. So um, caffeine is not found just in coffee or tea, but do note that Coca-Cola, Red Bull also contain a lot of caffeine. Then of course, unfortunately, I think this is everybody's favorite, chocolates. Um, chocolate itself also tend to loosen the door and not make it close as tightly. Then next is um, peppermint, garlic, and onion. So all these three also tend to loosen the door a little bit. And um, when the door is not closed very tight, um, it tends to reflux upwards. So these are the common food triggers for bloating. Uh, beans tend to cause bloating, same as dairy products. The aromatic vegetables like garlic, onions, all tend to cause as well. Uh, lentils and cruciferous veggie like um, broccoli or cauliflower also tend to cause all these bloating symptoms.
So there's a question specifically to ask about whether there's any food that can strengthen the door. The unfortunate um, answer to that question is, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a, a food that you can take that can strengthen the door to make it close tighter. But however, um, there are actually non-medication methods to help with the symptoms. So we will break them down into lifestyle habits. Um, so if you are usually leading a generally sedentary lifestyle where you don't really exercise very much, sometimes if you're always sitting down or lying down most of the time, the intestines also get a bit lazier over time and the ability to digest also slows down. So if you could actually lead a healthier life uh, style, meaning you try to increase your physical activities, try to run a little bit more, exercise a bit more, you may find that um, going to the toilet to pass motion or the bloating symptoms tend to get better and easier. Because when you exercise, the, the, the digestive tracts uh, wakes up as well. And um, it tends to move a bit better. So patients do find that, them, that themselves actually uh, um, improving their digestive uh, system. Then for those who are on um, uh, more overweight side, um, losing weight will be useful to help with um, bloating and reflux symptoms. Because as mentioned earlier, when um, a person is overweight, um, there's a lot of abdominal pressure pressing on the stomach and it tends to push the food upwards as well. Um, if you can, smoking is something that you should try to stop as much as you can because um, smoking not only does it cause gastric problem, um, it also harms the lungs. Lah. So of course, um, yeah, if you could, stop in, stop, stopping smoking is probably one of the best things you can do to help your health. Then for alcohol, I know um, to many people, it's a very important drink which you cannot abstain from. So the most important thing is to use alcohol in moderation. So some people say, no, I don't drink very often, but then I only drink like once a month. But then when they drink, they will down a few bottles of red wine and all those. So those are not in moderation. So in moderation, I refer to uh, maybe when you have a meal, a glass or two or even three is okay. Yeah. Or of course, um, everybody's a bit different. If you know that by your second, your third glass, um, your symptoms tend to come on, then you may want to stop at one. Um, then for those who are working in the office, they tend to have to wear very um, slim fit clothing or a very tight belt. So if you go for lunch, then after you go back to your office and you sit down in front of a computer, then essentially the belt gets even tighter. So if you have a very tight clothing, uh, it also tends to um, restrict your abdomen and the food also tend to reflux up. And you also feel very bad bloating because of that. So it will be useful if you try to wear loose clothing and your symptoms will not be as bad. Then uh, lastly, uh, avoid lying down within four hours after a meal, if it's possible. I, I saw there's a, a comment about um, uh, uh, um, your, uh, that, that, that people after <laughs> um, having a nap about two hours after lunch. <laughs> so, so I guess four hours is a guide because in general, for most patients without medical problem, within four hours, the stomach would be emptied already, meaning the food would have passed down to the small intestines and it is less likely for somebody to have a reflux. Um, but that four hours uh, will also depend on the meal that you have taken because if only eaten a very small little bun, uh, it is less likely for it to take four hours to clear. Lah or even small amount of oats, usually about one or two hours is fine. So the most important thing is if you can, um, try to avoid lying down immediately after the meal. Um, but of course, the door, which I mentioned, um, is the everybody's ability to close the door varies a little bit. Then of course, um, um, if you have been lying down after meal, a meal with no problem, then you are quite fortunate. Lah. But some people whose door couldn't close as well, they tend to get problem if they lie down immediately after a meal. So other than uh, this lifestyle habit, dietary habits will also be useful if you could try to take uh, regular meals. Um, and it's important for you to eat slowly, aim to finish your food in about 20 or 30 minutes. And do not eat 100% full. Um, try to aim only about 70 to 80% full. And one important thing why you need to eat slowly is because the ability for our stomach to tell the brain that the stomach is full, um, the, 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 the signal goes up to the brain very slowly. And on average, at least 15 to 20 minutes. 
So if you are if 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 you're like the NS boys, right, where they just go to the cook house and then there's a big plate of rice, and within five to ten minutes they gobbled everything down, um, they may not feel full yet. But then after they stand up and start to walk around, then suddenly they get fuller and fuller because the signal suddenly by the time the brain reaches is too full already. So by eating slowly really helps to minimize you, uh, you from overeating. So on average, it will be best to aim um, to be about 70 to 80% full. But I know many Chinese um, mothers usually will actually tell their children, well, I must make sure you eat very, very full. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I think this is something that we need to uh, be mindful about, um, that we should really try to avoid overeating. Um, for many of you um, with gastric symptoms, you would have known that uh, what are your common food triggers. If you know that you're taking spicy food tend to worsen your problem, uh, you can actually try to avoid that. Then um, if you could, after a meal, it will be very useful if you could move around like a, a stroll for about 10 to 15 minutes. That will really help um, with the digestion. Okay, so when dietary or lifestyle measure, methods fail, uh, it's probably beneficial to just have a review by your doctor. Um, common medication that you can find over the counter or even from the prescription itself will be antacids. Um, then, wait, sorry, I don't know why it jumped. Ah, so common medication will be antacids where it's this white color liquid um, that you can drink. Um, then the alternative group of medication will be what we call uh, acid suppressants. So the difference between these two medications, which I will always tell my patient, is that the antacid um, it is uh, alkaline fluid. So it tends, when after drinking the, the antacids, you get more immediate relief. That means if there's fire already, you drink the thing, it douses off the fire faster than the acid suppressant. Because on average, the acid suppression capsules or tablets takes about 30 minutes or so for the full effect to kick in. So antacid works faster, but then it doesn't last very long. Acid suppressant works slower, but it lasts a lot longer. So these two medications can be taken together actually um, to actually maximize the effect. Lah. So if you have very bad gastric or heartburn symptoms, um, you can try taking the antacid first for more immediate relief. Then um, the acid suppressants can then come in to get you have a longer relief. So one thing um, which I would like to also uh, share with y'all is uh, what we call mindful eating. I think uh, Brahm Center has also have a, a, a session on mindful eating as well. So important thing is um, many of us, especially in Singapore, uh, when we eat, um, there's usually a phone in front of us and you are happily clicking through the phone or watching Korea drama or we eat in front of the uh, TV. Or if you're working, you usually um, type on a computer and eat at the same time. So when we eat like this, um, we tend to overeat. Uh, when there's a lot of distraction. We also tend to eat very quickly without really um, chewing the food properly. And we tend to uh, just swallow very quickly. And the thing is that because if you are not eating mindfully, your body doesn't really know that you're really eating, then um, you tend to feel very hungry even though you have finished your meal. You just feel not satisfied. So um, being mindful uh, about what you eat, slowing down, um, not rushing and appreciating your meal makes you feel, um, uh, makes you less likely going to overeat, make you enjoy the meal a little bit more and also um, makes you appreciate what you're eating as well. So sometimes um, a lot of uh, problems with our intestinal tract can actually be helped um, if you eat mindfully. So of course, um, you can uh, ask Angie if you would like to find out more about mindful eating later. <laughs> so um, just want to ask a question here. Have you ever wondered why restaurants like Fish & Co or Hai Di Lao, the steamboat place, and many other restaurants offer you mints like mentos at the cashier uh, or immediately after your meal? Not sure whether you have ever realized that um, usually at multiple restaurants, even in US, if you go to US uh, after a steak, uh, you go to the steakhouse and all those, they tend to offer you uh, this type of mints. So 
The thing about mints is, um, as I showed you earlier, peppermint itself actually tend to loosen the door. So um, what mints does is actually help you vent out the excessive gas by loose, uh, loosening the door, the lower esophageal sphincter muscle. Because by loosening the door, um, the air tend to, you tend to burp more easily and it makes you feel uh, more comfortable. So actually when they offer mints to you, it is for your benefit. Lah. Because if you think about it, um, the, the places that tend to offer mints are usually places that sell very oily, uh, very fatty food. Yeah. So by taking mints itself would be useful. Um, however, if you go for a buffet and you really overeat that, that evening and you are really very bloated, um, one thing you can consider doing other than eating mints is you can also drink peppermint tea. Uh, peppermint tea itself have the same effect. Um, it tends to also help you burp out the gas as well so that you feel less bloated. Then the picture on the right are the anti-bloating food, um, which you can also consider taking to minimize your bloating symptoms in general. Okay, so I'd like to just share this uh, relatively common problem uh, in Singapore. Uh, which is lactose intolerance. So a lot of people may think that lactose intolerance is um, not very common and it affects only a minority of Singaporeans because everybody's drinking milk, right? Everybody likes cheese, everybody loves dairy products. So there's a study being conducted uh, where they actually, it's a worldwide study uh, where we talked about, uh, where they investigate the, the uh, prevalence of uh, lactose intolerance. So if you look at the picture, um, the global um, prevalence of lactose intolerance is probably around 70%. So um, it is normal for you to get lactose intolerant because you belong to the majority. Um, and for Asians, uh, more than 90% of uh, us actually have lactose intolerance. So many of you must be wondering, hey, you have been drinking milk, how come you got no problem? So for lactose intolerance, it is something that is, um, there is different grades. Everybody has a bit of lactose intolerance, but how sensitive you are depends on your dietary habits in the past. Um, if you are uh, um, Asian and you actually stop any dairy product since uh, younger days, um, then the older you are, the more likely you get very significant lactose intolerance. However, um, if you're adulthood and yet you still eat um, dairy products on a very regular basis, um, your ability to tolerate lactose will be much higher compared to the first group that I discussed. So you should not have much problem when you take dairy products. But in an event, in an event where you have to take large amount of uh, lactose or dairy products, that's where you may actually get a bit of uh, lactose intolerance symptoms. So one example is my wife who has a bit of lactose intolerance. So she usually add a uh, uh, milk to her coffee. So it's just a very small cup. So most of the time she had no problem. So one fine day we just went to this um cafe where we just order this large latte. Uh, it's meant to be shared between me and her. So um, that day, I just feel a bit bloated. So I decided not to drink. So it's just she just finished the entire cup herself. And very soon after um, that, that large cup of latte with lots of milk, she started rushing for toilet. But this is something that she never had when she drank with that small uh, glass. So a lot of this is really the volume and the amount that matters. So common symptoms of lactose intolerance is the abdominal cramp, bloating, and barrier symptoms. And the reason is because as we get older, um, the, we actually stop producing lactase as much. So that's why we cannot digest this sugar, lactase, which is commonly found in milk. And when we cannot digest it properly, this sugar will be um, fermented in our intestines where we form a lot of gas and acid. That's when we get a lot of cramps and diarrhea. So what you can do if you have lactose intolerant, um, the question is whether you want to avoid it totally or should you just limit your intake? Personally, I feel that limiting intake will be a lot easier because um, if you think about it, if you go to the supermarket, a lot of food products actually contains uh, lactose. So uh, I think limiting intake would be a lot easier because you still get to enjoy a wide variety of food. Um, so the thing is you have to then understand which are the food products that has lesser lactose amount. 
So things like yogurt, which is already, um, the bacteria has already fermented it already, actually re remove part of the lactose in the milk. Skim milk and low-fat milk also tend to contain less lactose compared to whole milk. And of course, for those who enjoy drinking Enlin or Ensure milk supplements, those also are lactose-free. Then for hard cheese like cheddar, uh, usually tend to have less lactose compared to soft cheese like burrata. Then of course, if you would like to maintain your tolerance towards lactose, right? Um, sometimes you may actually drink small amount of milk each time. And when you drink, you may want to drink together at, uh, with a meal because uh, it makes you your body able to tolerate the milk a bit better. Then over time, your body may slowly produce a bit more lactase. So you will be less intolerant. Of course, the process of building tolerance may cause you uh, a lot of trips to the toilet. Yeah, so this for those who wants to um, try to still eat some lactose and want to build tolerance to, to lactose. So of course, if all else fails, um, there are actually uh, proprietary medicine that contains lactase, which is the enzyme to help um, digest uh, the, the lactose. You can actually buy it, but not commonly found in Singapore. Uh, sometimes um, taking probiotics, some patients may find that it is useful as well. Oops, my start is running again. Sorry about that. Right, then worst case scenario is really uh, to take lactose-free uh, uh, products or lactose-reduced products. Uh, lastly, I'll just con um, talk very quickly about constipation. So constipation, uh, we tend to feel a very tight, crampy, like a fist clenching, that kind of feeling uh, in the lower abdomen or the middle abdomen. So um, in the symptoms itself for constipation, um, uh, other than the cramps, um, patients may feel that the, the stool doesn't come out very well, or even if it comes out, you feel that it's very hard, or after passing, you feel that it's not cleared properly, still got something left inside. So one important thing is um, a lot of patients will ask, hey, so what is constipation? Is it just passing hard stools or is it uh, passing very infrequently? Um, so I just want to highlight that the normal bowel output for um, individual varies very significantly. To somebody, it can be normal for them to pass motion once every day. But to others, their norm may be passing motion once or twice per week. And um, if that is somebody that has been passing motion once or twice per week since their childhood till now, um, this could actually be their normal habit. So what is normal um, very depend, really depends on the individual, what they were like uh, in the past. And whether this problem of constipation is it a new problem or an old problem. If it's an old problem, meaning um, from primary school days till now, it has always been like that for the past 50 years, then this is unlikely anything of concern. But of course, in the past, you've been passing motion every day. Then suddenly, these two months, you can only pass once a week. Then something is not right here because it's not, some, not your usual habit. So when you see a doctor for constipation, it will be useful for you to note down what is the frequency of the uh, bowel output, meaning once every two or three days or once every five days. And how long has this constipation problem been bothering you? And for your stool consistency, you can look at the chart on the right. Um, these are the things that the doctors may ask you to look at um, to, to tell us what is the consistency and how hard is the stool. And whether there are any other worrisome symptoms which I'll cover later. And how does this constipation affect your life? Meaning, um, does it make you unable to go to work or make you so painful that you couldn't sleep at night? So the worrisome symptoms that we would like to highlight will be things like weight loss. Or un I mean, uh, uh, this, this weight loss is unintended weight loss. Uh, you're not able to eat your meals anymore. Or even when you pass motion, there's blood coming out. Or suddenly you notice that the caliber of the stools are very, very thin like pencils. Or if there's a strong family history of cancer within the family. And lastly, if you are not able to eat and keep vomiting already. These are all, not un uh, these are all unusual symptoms. And if you have any of this, you should actually get a doctor's consultation. So 
Um, anybody with this worrisome symptom should go for a, a consultation. And these are the three most common uh, investigation tests um, that the doctor usually will of offer you. On the top left-hand side, there's this two occult blood test, which is free by Health Promotion Board. Um, so essentially, um, you can collect it from the pharmacies or the uh, polar clinic where you get the stool kit to check whether there's blood. But usually by the time that patients have worrisome symptoms, meaning weight loss or vomiting or passing out blood, really, I think um, the more important investigation that we need to do will either be the colonoscopy or the CT scan itself to help us see truly whether there's anything more sinister hiding inside. So for constipation itself, um, other causes will also include a low fiber diet um, because sometimes if we really enjoy McDonald's, if you look at McDonald's, um, there's really not much fiber in the diet other than the sesame seeds uh, and the lettuce in the burger because other than that, um, everything else is low fiber. Or if you don't drink enough water, you also tend to get constipation. Uh, if you don't exercise and mainly a um, very sedentary type of lifestyle, um, the intestines may also become a bit slower. And as we age, it's also quite normal for our intestines to get um, to slow down as well. Then, of course, if you are taking certain medication, especially iron supplements, it tends to make the motion, the stools a bit harder uh, to come out. Then um, there may also be other medical conditions uh, which the doctor will help to actually help evaluate for, to see um, whether that could be a cause of the constipation. So in general, for the management of constipation, we would advise the patient to have an uh, active lifestyle exercise uh, at least three to four times a week if you can, uh, increase your fiber intake and also drink more water. So for fiber itself, uh, we usually divide the fiber into soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So um, these two types of fiber essentially gives us, uh, 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 make it easier for us to actually digest our food and also make it easier for us to actually pass out the stool. Not only does it help with our digestion and constipation, do note that having a high fiber diet can also help uh, to actually uh, modulate the sugar in our blood. So it actually helps with patients with um, uh, diabetes or patients who want to prevent themselves from having diabetes. So you should actually take a, a diet that's richer in fiber because it really um, slow down the sugar peaks after a meal. So these are just some examples of what is soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And um, this slide is uh, quite important. Um, so I just wanted to share some more natural remedies for um, constipation. So um, in the picture here, uh, I, I, uh, most, the, the most evidence-based um, uh, food here that helps with constipation, um, surprisingly, is actually kiwi fruit. Um, so kiwi is actually high in uh, fiber because you know there are multiple seeds as well. And also it actually promotes good intestinal bacterial growth which will help patients with um, constipation. Other things that can also help will be taking prune or prune juice or even pear juice. Uh, these are the common things that can help patients with passing motion. But of course, what, what works for some people may not work for others. Lah. Then uh, for the non-medication method, um, setting this step stool will also be useful. Uh, I've covered up the brand because I cannot be promoting the brand. Uh, so essentially, if you look at the picture over here, let me get my annotation tool up. Okay, so if you look at the picture here, um, you can see that when we sit down, there is an angle like this. Uh, so if we squat with our legs up, it actually straightens up the, the, the rectum to make it easier for the stool to come out. So having this step stool actually helps to uh, make one pass out the motion easier without the need to actually squeeze as hard. Lah. So of course, you can imagine maybe 50 years ago, um, everybody is actually using a squat toilet and sitting toilet is very uncommon then. But now I think sitting, sitting toilet is the default, but squatting toilet is the abnormal and very uncommon one. But do note that when humans are born, um, the evolution-wise, we are born to actually pass motion squatting down. 
So which is why in this posture, um, when you're squatting, the rectum actually straightens up and it relaxes the muscle that constricts the rectum and makes the stool come out easier. So um, some of this you can buy from some of the, the mama stalls and some, some shops, they sell it. Oops, okay, I'll just clear the annotation. All right, so other methods will be massaging your tummy. So you can see that the large intestines go from the right side, go upward across the tummy to the left and go down and then to the anus to pass out. So um, some other methods you can consider is massaging your tummy in a circular manner uh, as shown in this picture in a clockwise circular manner. So um, that will also help to um, co coax the intestine to pass it out more easily. La. So of course, um, when common lifestyle or dietary measure fails, uh, some people may actually look for the over-the-counter medicine. So for over-the-counter medicine, in general, we will group that into this three group. It may be fiber. Uh, fiber commonly will be fiber gel or fibrosol, which is a soluble fiber. Uh, it actually helps to box out the stools and lubricates it so it's easier to come out. Then uh, the next most commonly used uh, drug is actually lactulose, which is the lactose, this white color bottle. Uh, it's essentially this colorless, uh, very, very sweet syrup that actually causes osmotic diarrhea. So when I say osmotic diarrhea, means that the sugar in the lactulose itself actually uh, absorbs water into the intestines um, so that it softens the stools and make it easier to come out. So many patients who are on lactulose ask me whether it would actually worsen their diabetes because it's really very sweet. So one important thing I want to share with everybody is um, lactulose is actually very, very safe. Um, the, the sugar that we taste is a form of sugar that our body cannot absorb. So it stays within the intestines and we pass out all this so it doesn't worsen the diabetes control. Then lastly will be the stimulant medication where we um, take the medication to try to actually um, ask the intestine to squeeze a bit harder uh, for the stool to come out. But that itself, the side effects to co may cause quite a fair bit of cramps. So uh, this last bit is well, what we call functional GI disorder. So when we do all the investigation, the doctors may not find any cause, but truly patient may feel pain with the gastric. Uh, discomfort or even burning sensation uh, over the chest um, despite having a normal scope or normal scan. Um, so functional GI disorder essentially refers to this group of patients who are suffering from true pain and the reason for the pain is really because of the hypersensitivity of the pain receptors in the intestines. So um, this is also commonly what people commonly call uh, IBS. La. Although IBS is not a technically correct term, uh, but yeah, uh, functional GI disorder is the big umbrella for this. I will cover a little bit more about IBS uh, shortly. So essentially, um, what exactly is functional GI disorder is uh, essentially when our brain is very, very stressed or very anxious, um, this, this signals get transmitted down to our uh, digestive tracts. And um, as a result, it caused the digestive tract to be hypersensitive. Uh, same stimuli, meaning a bloating to, to a patient with very hypersensitive uh, intestines can feel very, very bad pain. And other than that, um, the, the, the stress itself has also been um, shown that it can actually cause alteration to the gut, uh, to the intestine uh, bacteria, um, causing uh, more unhealthy intestine bacteria to grow compared to the healthy ones. So all this contributes to this um, functional GI disorders. So if you would like to know the different types of functional GI disorder, uh, irritable bowel syndrome um, belongs to a subset of it. Lah. So there are many, many, many types. So um, this actually just shows the IBS with a different subtype where patients may have diarrhea predominant symptoms, or they may have constipation predominant symptoms associated with the tummy pain. However, there are patients with just um, what we call centrally mediated abdominal pain, where they just get pain without much uh, constipation or diarrhea symptoms. So in fact, the symptoms may be very similar to what I've described uh, earlier, uh, the bloating symptoms, the heartburn, nausea, or bloating. 
this is a very, very common problem actually in the world. Um, this study was done in 2020, where you see almost the most part of the, those areas that are in grey don't have any data. But if you see those with data, we are mainly in the red or orange zone. So really, um, the prevalence of functional GI disorder is about 40% worldwide. So how about Singapore? From the very same paper, Singapore is about 31.1%. And um, predominantly females, slightly more than males. So functional GI disorder is also commonly associated with anxiety or even depression. So um, if you look at it, um, this anxiety actually feeds and worsens functional GI disorder. So using this as an example, you can see that um, uh, a patient is hungry and he's purposely restricting the food intake so that she can go out with her friends because she feels that after eating food, she tends to get cramps in the tummy, then she needs to find toilet. So um, whenever there's some rumbling, then she is hypervigilant. Oh no, is that rumbling? Something wrong? Is that something wrong? And when she starts thinking about it, oh, it's bad, right? She just convinces herself that this is bad and there's fear coming in and she must go to the toilet very soon. And she look around and she notice, hey, there's no toilet nearby. Then when there's fear, then there's when the fight and flight uh, response starts to come, then the patient may just think, okay, since um, there's no nearby toilet, uh, I, I, I may not want to you know, get bad cramps and have to rush to the toilet midway through the party. I think I better leave now before anybody notice me. That's where the behavior actually goes out of proportion. But of course, if you think about it, this rumbling of the tummy is quite common. If you're hungry, you get rumbling of your tummy. But then um, when we become hypervigilant, um, we get fearful of the symptoms and we get very anxious. Um, this actually just feedback to ourselves to tell us um, that this truly is something wrong. So, so do note that um, patients with functional GI disorder uh, may have anxiety symptoms and the anxiety symptoms tend to worsen the functional GI disorder. So in terms of the general management, I think the most important thing is for, uh, for you to seek uh, a medical consultation to confirm that truly there's nothing sinister and confirm that it's likely a functional GI disorder. After excluding the worrisome things, I think the next most important thing to actually help with the symptom is have a trusting relationship with the managing doctor. Because without trust, um, it is difficult for the doctor to prescribe something that would be useful for you. After the trust is there, that's where a bit of a trial of treatment and then we adjust along the way would be important. Because when somebody has functional GI disorder, there isn't one medication that I give you, then immediately the next visit, the pain will be gone totally. Mainly it will be to actually help to improve the symptoms and adjust lifestyle and slowly improve along the way. It's not like a magical pill where I just give you one week course of the medicine, then by the next week, you are totally normal. Are usually not like that. So of course, um, when we see the doctor and the doctor notice that, hey, this person is actually going through quite a lot of st um, stress or maybe even um, clinical depression or even anxiety problems, um, that's where we may actually consider referring to a psychiatrist or a psychologist for additional uh, assistance. Or sometimes um, they may be going through a rough patch at home um, where we may need to ask for a counsellor to step in and help. Or sometimes the work environment is just too stressful for the person where a change of environment may be useful. I just wanted to share my patient symptoms because I think earlier part of this year, um, because of COVID, um, there's a lot of lockdown and all the elderly patients are actually asked to stay at home. So my patients actually tend to enjoy going to the day center, go and do Tai Chi, go out with her friends and go out for breakfast after that. But because of COVID, actually she's cooped up at home the whole day for many, many weeks and months. So as a result, her, her, her functional GI symptoms tend to get worse. Um, and really with medi medication, multiple different types of medication, she couldn't actually uh, get better. That's where I actually look at her, uh, her, the factors that is actually affecting her life in general. Then I actually try to arrange for activities for her out. I mean, uh, I mean the daycare activities. We actually get um, staff to actually come in to help her. 
Um, and then when she restarted her routine of going back to the daycare activity center, going out with her friends, uh, albeit less than usual, actually her symptoms actually gets better. So um, probiotics will be useful for patients with functional GI disorder, and usually um, there are actually probiotics that are natural. Um, so common food will be things like yogurt, tempeh, kombucha, kefir, miso, kimchi, sauerkraut, and also pickles. And these are food that is easily found in Singapore. Then for those who would like uh, to take the, the packaged probiotics, uh, there are multiple versions available. No, not, not to say that one is better than the other. Um, probiotics usually contains different types of uh, strains of bacteria. And what your body truly needs may not be what your friend needs. So everybody is a bit different. So there is a bit of trial and error here. And for probiotics, usually I'll tell my patient to try for at least about a month. Uh, before you see whether it's effective or not. Lastly, um, there's this thing called low FODMAP diet. FODMAP is essentially a type of sugar uh, that we eat in our food, and this sugar tend to get uh, fermented and form a lot of gas. So when patients take food that is very high in FODMAPs, uh, it tends to cause a lot of gas and cramps. So taking a low FODMAP diet may help for some patients. So of course, um, this is just a guide about uh, what are the low FODMAP diet. So um, easy things, for example, like um, if you go and order a noodles, instead of taking the yellow noodles, which is high FODMAP, you may choose rice noodle, uh, like the kui tiao, bee hoon. Uh, these are low FODMAP. Yeah, so this is just an example. For those who would like to read a little bit more, can actually um, search out this uh, reference I showed in the slide. Uh, this Monash uh, FODMAP uh, group where actually they wrote specifically about the Singapore diet. So you can actually go and read it. Then um, they also came up with this low FODMAP diet mobile app. Unfortunately, I think it's chargeable at about $11 or $12, depending on whether you use uh, Android or Apple. Um, do note that there are also free mobile apps available. You can just download and just try to see uh, whether it's useful for you. All right. So in summary, um, for all these GI disorders, um, it's important for you to actually seek medical consultation early, especially if you have any worrisome symptoms. Then living an active lifestyle, exercise regularly would be actually good for you uh, because it helps to improve our digestive movement and also improve our digestive system. Then mindful eating, eating slowly, appreciating the food that you eat and not overeat will be very essential as well because a lot of times our symptoms are related to overeating. And then lastly, the food that I shared um, to avoid and to take uh, mainly serves as a reference. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to stick exactly to what is mentioned uh, because if not, um, sometimes your life can be quite miserable because this one also cannot eat, that one also cannot eat, quite poor thing. Lah. So I think in, in general, those are guide and it serves as uh, what are the things in general you should try to minimize uh, rather than avoid totally. So um, with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Sorry, I overran a little bit. So the bike is a bit faster. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for the excellent talk. Thank you, Angie. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of questions already being posted. Stress, stress. stress. <laughs> so I'd like everyone to uh, read the questions that others have posted as well and upvote. So the most uh, popular questions will then be uh, bubbling up for uh, quicker attention by Dr. Ng because I don't think he can answer all the questions. So if, if you can find a question similar to yours, please upvote. Over to you, Dr. Ng. Thank you. So I'll just answer the question, the topmost question, I guess. Okay, so um, Fish asks a question, can reflux be diagnosed through endoscopy as well? So the answer is yes. So reflux um, can be diagnosed through endoscopy, but endoscopy or scopes itself can only diagnose the more severe type of reflux where we actually see acid burning of the foot pipe. However, if the reflux is mild, uh, the scope itself cannot confirm reflux. That's where we may need to do a more, uh, 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 what we call a pH uh, testing or a manometry testing to confirm. And that you need, may need to see a, a specialist for that. Then uh, answer already done. 
Okay, so um, does sleeping sideway helps? Uh, for for those who are, uh, I think specifically the part is to ask about whether sleeping sideway help to reduce reflux. So uh, there are some uh, that suggest that sleeping on your right side would be more useful than sleeping on your left side. Um, personally, I feel that um, it may not make too much of a difference, but if you would like to try, um, because of the anatomy of the stomach, sleeping on the right side tend to reduce the likelihood of reflux, but it's not uh, better than sleeping a bit propped up. La. So is burping one of the bloating things? So bloat, uh, burping itself means the air coming out to your upper chest, then you hear the, the sound come out from the mouth. Um, that is a natural way for us to vent out excessive gas in our stomach. So of course, when you are bloated, you tend to burp a bit more. So, um, but however, there are some people who just likes to have the uh, habit of burping to just make sure that they don't have a lot of gas in the tummy. Yeah, so it, it's not necessarily um, burping must equate to bloating, but bloating patients tend to have more burping. So why do I, um, there's a question from Julie about why she felt nausea at the throat after eating. So basically this question, I think will be a bit hard to answer um, just based on one liner. So this one, I think best will be to perhaps um, speak to a doctor about it. Um, they will be able to ask a little bit more question to confirm um, truly what is the problem that is actually um, troubling you. Um, what is the self-help uh, for chest discomfort like gaviscon, omeprazole, one per day for four weeks minimum. Okay, so basically for your gaviscon, omeprazole, right? So gaviscon, you can use it about um, three to four times a day is fine. And you can use it before or after meals, not a problem. Uh, for the duration, I would usually say um, uh, use, use for the days that you are symptomatic. And when you feel better already, you may wish to stop it. It's not like antibiotics where you have to finish a total course of one week or four weeks. For omeprazole, it is the acid suppression tablet, uh, capsule, sorry. Um, this itself, actually, you need to take specifically at least 30 to 60 minutes before your food because um, the, the medication needs food to activate the medicine. So if you take omeprazole after your meal, uh, it is not as effective. So you should take it um, before food. Similarly, for gab like gaviscon, you don't need to take a specific duration to complete. Then Mui Ying asked about, um, tend to have diarrhea on the onset of my period. Can menopause also bring about discomfort like diarrhea or bloating? Uh, so yes, uh, definitely. For uh, When patients have menstruations, uh, there is a lot of hormonal surges. So some patients may tend to find that they may even get nausea or vomiting symptoms or even diarrhea symptoms um, around the period of the menstruation. So um, to that question, the answer is yes. Uh, so a friend rushed to A&E thinking that it's heart attack but end up being reflux. How to tell the difference, right? So of course, sometimes when the reflux is very severe, um, they may feel a very tight burning sensation in the middle chest. So um, that's where it can be mistaken as a heart attack. My, because the thing is, um, no matter how I can, how much I describe to you, um, it will be difficult when you are truly having the symptoms uh, to really differentiate, okay, this must be hard, but let's just ignore it. So my, my adv advice to you is if the symptoms is really that bad and it's difficult to differentiate, right? Um, it will still be best for you to just go and seek a medical attention. I'll rather you be wrong than you just don't go and see attention thinking there's reflux, right? Then uh, miss the boat, lah. Because if it's a heart attack, truly, um, you need to go into the hospital as early as possible so that we can help to open up the blocked, uh, blood vessels of the uh, heart. So I, I would say that if there's any bad chest discomfort and um, it's difficult to differentiate between heartburn or a heart attack, it's best to go and seek uh, medical attention. So um, Stefan mentioned about a few doses of pochai peel with two hour gaps improved and what is the cause? Uh, I'm not sure what the context is and what has improved, uh, but I do know that Pochai Plus contains a wide variety of uh, Chinese herbs. So I do not know whether it contains things that actually help to absorb the gas and um, uh, uh, diarrhea symptoms. So uh, yeah, so, so that's why it's uh, a bit difficult to answer your question. So sorry, because of lack of context. 
uh, Ron, uh, I have endless cough due to excessive phlegm in my throat. I do have GERD disease. GERD means a reflux disease as well. Uh, would the GERD have actually contributed to my endless cough? So uh, Ron, um, GERD itself can actually um, predispose a person to recurring cough. So for, for the cough to be truly related to GERD, it tends to be uh, worsened. Uh, the symptoms tend to be worse when you are lying down uh, position because when you're lying down the reflux time to come up more easily and when the reflux come out it's the acid that goes down to the throat that's causing the irritation and cough so of course if um, this is really very debilitating and you really want to get to the root of it uh, what you can do is you can see a gastro specialist for this um, they may need to do a special study where they put a special probe uh, tubing through the nose into the food pipe to see truly how often the reflux are. And whenever you have the cough, whether it also, uh, whether the tubing actually read that there's acid refluxing out. So you can be 100% sure whether truly your cough is related to your reflux. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Ron. So there's a question about uh, flatulence, which is bloating and how to reduce. So uh, reduce um, the bloating sensation will be uh, what I discussed earlier, where if you increase your physical activities, exercising more regularly, um, that will help to actually improve the digestive tract and hopefully less constipation. Uh, that will help with the reduction of gas. Then, of course, for the food itself, um, if you could try to take the uh, less gas-forming food, uh, that will also help as well. And that part has been covered in the slides earlier. So fish asks about kiwi, whether it is uh, regarded as acidic. So yes, uh, kiwi is acidic. So of course, um, some patients uh, may not be able to take any acidic food at all. So but kiwi, what it does is helpful for constipation because of the seeds and all those. So um, if you can tolerate kiwi, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, it's not, it may not necessarily worsen your, your dyspepsia symptoms. But of course, if you are really worried, sometimes you can take it together with a meal. That means um, you feel your food already then you can take a bit of kiwi um, that reduces the the chances of kiwi causing the um, gastric pain symptoms because there's already food other food inside your stomach so um, even there's as any acidity the other food will tend to neutralize the acidity in the kiwi la. right then there's a question on can, oh show the probiotic slides again uh, let me get the slides Probiotics slides. Uh, this talk has been recorded, so any one of you will be able to go to the Brahm Center YouTube uh, channel to ah. <laughs> talk and retrieve any of these slides so that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Yeah, yeah, progress with the other questions. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, there's a question of uh, after a period of irregular meals, I have a quiet, poor appetite and feel nauseous after a meal. Uh, will it get better over time with good lifestyle habits or do I need medication? So um, I think the first thing is to have a good lifestyle and dietary habit first. And of course, if it fails, then um, you can try medication. If it still fails, then really, I think you may need to seek uh, uh, medical attention because sometimes uh, it can be other causes as well. Um, then how often can one take probiotics and does it help with the gut microbiome? Uh, so yes, uh, probiotics or even prebiotic, which is food for the bacteria, probiotics, uh, actually helps with the microbiome, which is the bacteria population in our gut. So usually our advice to patient is you take once uh, per day. So depending on what probiotics you are taking, uh, it may be one or two or even four capsules per, per usage. La. So usually once a day, for at least a month uh, is my general advice for patients who are taking probiotics. But of course, if you like, you can always take the more natural probiotics found in food like tempeh, yogurt, or even yakult, vitagen, all this also can. So does antacid improve reflux or just a temporary measure and whether you will make the gut weaker? So antacid um, improves reflux and uh, I would say that it is like a, there is fire, you just put water to just put away the fire. Lah. So for most patients, actually after a while, um, it can actually help with the symptom and may not come back. For those who tend to have quite sensitive intestines, um, our advice is to take the omiprazole 
before meal together with the antacid. So the omeprazole, which is the acid suppressant, will provide a longer relief as opposed to where the antacid will just provide a faster immediate relief. Um, then taking long-term antacids doesn't weaken the, stomach, the, the intestine, it's safe. Um, then Dolly asked about how often um, we will need endoscopy, colonoscopy, or CD scan. Um, if all tests show no helicobacter infection, but symptoms of every reflux and bloatedness still persist despite probiotics, medication, and diet exercise, what is the solution? Okay, so with regard to the duration and the frequency of the scopes and scans, right? Um, for all Singaporeans above the age of 50 year old, uh, we would actually suggest going for a colonoscopy. And if the colonoscopy is normal, usually we will say about 5 to 10 years later. But of course, if the colonoscopy is abnormal, meaning there's polyps or there's abnormal growth, your doctor may actually suggest a slightly earlier interval. Uh, other than that, there's really no need for a regular uh, CT scan otherwise. So after investigation, uh, like is negative for the helicobacter and symptoms are all persistent, right? Um, this probably fall within the realm of functional GI diseases, uh, where really um, your doctor will have to talk to you to find out what exactly is, might be the potential triggers and what are the other medication other than the conventional antacids um, or even the acid suppression that can actually provide better relief for your symptoms. So uh, best to have a consultation with them. So Joyce asks, um, she always has some running nose and cough after meal. Could it be caused by reflux? So, well, I feel that the running nose and cough after meal. Okay, so for reflux, right, um, when it happens, you usually tend to cause cough. Uh, not so much running nose, but do note that sometimes if you eat very hot or spicy food, um, you tend to get uh, running nose and cough because of the steam and the irritation from the food itself. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether that might be the cause. Yeah, but yes, cough after a meal may be reflux, but running nose is rather uncommon. Then Daphne asked about the Bristol stool chart, about the seven different types of stools. And she asked about which type of stool is the most ideal. So I, I think there isn't one uh, type of stool that is the most normal, but everybody is a bit different. So uh, some people naturally is a bit softer. Some people naturally is a bit harder. So there isn't one normal stool. Lah. So of course, um, it will very much depend on what you feel is your norm. So there's a question about Stress and anxiety contribute to bloating, chest discomfort despite sleeping elevated. How reflux still occur upon waking up? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a question or a comment. Um, okay. So um, for, for patient with functional GI diseases, uh, sometimes the, the treatment will be harder to treat. Um, it will not be where we really have an acid reflux. Then uh, I give you the, uh, the gaviscon, then immediately the symptom goes away. Because um, when patients have functional GI disorders, they have very sensitive uh, pain receptors in the digestive tract. Just a little bit of an irritant, they may feel a very bad discomfort. So best similarly would be to get a medical consult and see um, whether they could help you better. So can see ask about uh, what has serious constipation when bowel halfway out and got stuck in the rectum, what is the best way to remove it as it's very uncomfortable, almost too hard to push out. Okay, so um, when the constipation is very bad and you feel that you want to pass motion and only a little bit could come out, uh, you, I, I would suggest um, avoid uh, putting a finger to dig it out. I know some people do that um, when they are really very desperate. Um, measures you could do is to actually try to take the stool softeners, which I shared earlier, um, to hopefully make the stool a little bit softer. Uh, so that's easier to pass out naturally uh, without the need to put in something more invasive in the backside. But of course, if that fails, um, you may actually consider enemas. Enemas can also be found off the counter where it comes in a tube with a small little applicator to put inside the rectum and you squeeze this liquid into the, uh, the rectum. So that it, what it does, it actually softens the stool so it's easier to come out. Uh, okay, I think we've answered Dolly's question already. Okay, then uh, Yvonne, um, I have stomach pain on the first and second day of menses uh, nearly every month. Uh, what action should I take? 
uh, see doctor on the day of pain immediately. Okay, so I guess uh, Yvonne, for your symptoms, it might be related to your menses cramps. So uh, it will be best if when you go and see a doctor to tell the doctor the location of the pain um, and exactly what is the nature of the pain. So of course, um, because stomach is very non-specific, I presume it's the upper tummy area. So um, when a patient has menses, uh, there's a lot of hormonal changes. So they tend to sometimes have some uh, uh, intense intestinal tract symptoms as well. Uh, you need not see the doctor immediately on the day of the pain. Uh, but of course, when there are days that's really very bad, I guess you can go and see the doctor that day and perhaps get a proper review. Lah. Yeah. So of course, if the pain is been there for, uh, is consistently like that, I think it's better to just take a look to make sure that it's normal. So Zippy asked uh, whether it's better to eat fruits before or after a meal. Uh, unfortunately, I, there isn't, I don't think, not to my knowledge, I don't think there's a study that, that studies this before or after. But in general, I think the advice is to uh, avoid very, uh, taking large amount of watery stuff before your meal. Lah. So uh, is it normal to sometimes move bowel twice a day or normally it's one, just once a day? Okay, so occasionally sometimes it may be normal for you to pass motion more than once a day uh, because um, what we pass out very much depends on our diet. So um, it will actually be quite normal if it's occasionally that one or two days that you just get a bit more frequent, especially if you eat a little bit more that day or especially if you eat very spicy food that few days. So ZP asks, can you explain again why Parkinson's could be a cause of uh, constipation, I think? So Parkinson's disease, um, if you could recall, patients tend to, um, they have a slow, the, essentially what, what happened in Parkinson's itself, the muscle coordinations become a bit less good as it used to be. And Parkinson's patients tend to get um, slow intestine movement. So as a result, uh, they tend to get quite severe constipation problem. Yeah. So Stefan asked about uh, avoid lying down four hours after meal. Um, and usually during retirement, the meal is at 12 noon and nap is 2 to 3 p.m. So um, as I mentioned earlier, four, four hours after a meal is ideal because four hours is about the time we clear all the food in our stomach. But of course, um, if you don't eat a lot and your food is not that oily, usually um, two hours or three hours should be more than sufficient. Yeah, so of course, um, if you don't actually suffer for the problem of reflux when you lie down, then you're quite lucky. So, but not everybody is the same because the, 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 the muscle uh, may not close as tight as you. La. So the, some people may tend to get more reflux symptoms when lying down. Um, so Evelyn asked about, can you help us understand when diagnosed with inflamed intestines? Mm, yeah, okay, I'm not sure whether I understand this question. Uh, understand when that news. Mm, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Evelyn. I, I'm not sure whether I could understand your question. Or maybe Angie can help me out. <laughs> I think the question is uh, what's involved or what is happening with the inflamed intestines? Ah, okay. So, uh, pathogenesis of... <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, so basically, I think um, when... Um, I, I would say that the intestines are inflamed, uh, but more because uh, they are hypersensitive. Inflamed means that the whole intestine is swollen, then there may be ulcers, and usually those are a disease, like um, inflammatory bowel disease or infection. So, um, when a patient has functional GI disorder, um, this, the, the pain receptors in the intestines become very sensitive. So a little bit, then they will feel a lot of pain. So, um, and this happens because our brain and our gut are actually linked. So our pain sends the stress down to our gut and our gut actually send this stress to the pain receptors as they become very sensitive. And a little bit more gas, you can feel very more, uh, a lot more pain than other patients. Lah. All right. Kate, you have gone on for a long while. I hope you even have a drink in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I'm drinking my tea now. <laughs> yes. So perhaps just the last question and then we will close it. Uh, right. And I'm sure we all would like Dr. Ng back. So I'm sure <laughs> we'll have him back because he's such a good speaker and so uh, knowledgeable. Thank you, Angie. 
Thank so uh, I'll just take one last question. Oh. Yes, just okay. one question. Would so there's a question about, uh, I had an operation for umbilical hernia when I was seven year old, but now I'm 25. I wanted to ask if it is possibly a reason for my gastric problems now. So for umbilical hernia, um, essentially it's uh, for the umbilicus, the, there is a weakness in the muscle wall. So sometimes the umbilicus, uh, the hernia itself, the, the abdominal content may come out. Most commonly it's just uh, abdominal fats may come out or in a more severe situation, the intestine may even come out. So if the operation doesn't involve cutting any intestines, uh, it may not be a cause of the tummy problem. Uh, but however, if there's anything that results in opening up the, the abdomen, uh, it may cause a bit of what we call adhesions. Adhesions means scarring in the, intest uh, in the, in the abdomen. So when adhesions happens, uh, it's more common when people go for gallbladder surgery, more common when people go for bigger operation of the abdomen. So that's where it forms scars tissue and patients with this condition called adhesions may tend to get more colic and more pain and cramps. So of course, um, it will very much depend on what your stomach problems are, whether it's more like uh, adhesion colic type of pain. So of course, um, you may also wish to seek a medical consult to get a bit better uh, understanding about your symptoms as well.